Hi, this is my guest, Louis Camp. Yay, Louis, uh, author. And this is my ongoing friend of the show, Smokey Miles. And we are here tonight to celebrate a book called Dylan and Me. I know the camera can't come in, but you can imagine Bob Dylan on the left. <laughs> Louis, Louis Kemp, Kemp right. sometimes spells it with an S and sometimes yeah. with an E. Right. Um, and he wrote this book called Dylan and Me, 50 Years of Adventures. I can only imagine. So you guys met when he was 12 and you were 11. That's correct. At summer camp uh -huh. in northern Wisconsin. Bobby came to camp with his guitar and uh, used to take it everywhere with him and play it. And he would tell all the kids uh, over and over again, he said, I'm, I'm going to be a rock and roll star. Did anybody believe him? No. <laughs> but he said so many times to me, I was 11, I believed him. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. When I saw his determination, which was uh, amazing, he never, he never changed his mindset that that's, that's what was going to happen. He made it happen. And when you guys were that age, did he, did he play for you? Yeah, in those days he wasn't writing his own songs. He was playing. Woody Guthrie, or well, that Woody Guthrie came later. Okay. Uh, when he got to uh, to Minneapolis, when he uh, went to the U, U of M for a while. But uh, in those days he was playing Little Richard, uh, you know Jerry Lee Lewis, all all the popular James Brown, maybe. Uh, yeah, all the stuff of the day. You know, he was into he was a student of all that stuff, and he would sing all all those different things. And Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly was a big influence on Bobby. And uh, yes, all those songs. So you have a chapter in your book, don't you, where you mentioned Buddy Holly and Bob? I, I do, and uh, I'll read you a, a little excerpt from that. And, and what's the chapter <laughs> called? Uh, oh Boy, okay. which is one of Buddy's famous songs. Oh, it's right. called Oh Boy, right. Okay. The most important show to Bobby that year, though, was not one of his own performances. It was a show he seemed to know that he would never get to see again. The date was January 31st, 1959. It was a Saturday night, and with the wind chill, the temperature in Duluth was minus 44 degrees. Now, you know why I don't live there anymore. Right, yeah, right. The, the winters were tough there. <clears throat> the car we drove was, was my dad's, 58 metallic blue Buick. Bobby was 17, I was 16. And we were on the way to see what would be one of Buddy Holly's last concerts. He was 22, and it was just three days before he, Richie Valance, and the Big Bopper would perish in a plane crash while taking off in an Iowa blizzard. Another great Waylon Jennings would have been on that list had he not given up his seat to the Big Bopper. Waylon was unknown then, but he was playing in Buddy's backup band uh -huh. on that night. To this day, whenever Buddy Holly's classic, Oh Boy, comes on the radio, I feel the hairs on the back of my neck snap to attention. The words seemed to be emanating from his soul straight to my heart. This was my favorite song all through high school. Bobby's musical interests were much wider and deeper than mine. Even as a child, he faithfully listened to late night radio stations from the South, something that Buddy Holly had been doing in Lubbock, Texas just a few years before. When I think about it, there never seemed to be a time when Bobby had not been a big fan of Buddy's, there is no doubt that the rock and roll pioneer was a seminal influence in his musical life. Wow. There were many similarities between Buddy and Bobby, but one that Bobby probably wasn't aware of was that they each had a high school girlfriend named Echo. Right, but, I, you yeah. would tell me all the time about Echo. Yeah. Hellstrom. Yes, and, but the interesting thing is that Buddy, also in also. high school, his girlfriend was also named Echo, which is quite a coincidence. Yes. This is a rare name. Amazing. Amazing, yeah. It's widely known that one of Bob's classic songs, Girl from the North Country, was about his girlfriend, Echo Hellstrom. We arrived at the Duluth National Guard Army for something called the Winter Dance Party and found the tickets to be pretty pricey, ranging up to $2. Well, that was a lot of money back in 1959. Really? You could, yeah, you could go to a movie for 20, 25 cents. Wow. We pulled our resources and shoved our way in, working our way through the dancing, partying throng of 2,000 excited, withering young people. 
With Bobby in the lead, we snaked our way right up to the stage, the edge of the stage, mere feet away from where Buddy was performing. Oh, that's great. As still as a statue, Bobby stood there mesmerized, never taking his eyes off of Buddy. Perhaps time has embellished my memory of that night, but Buddy seemed to be smiling down on Bobby with an almost celestial countenance. Mm -hmm. At one point, he nodded to Bobby seemingly as if he knew his own remaining time was brief and that Bobby would one day take up his mantle as one of the greatest musical artists in the world. Only four years later, Bobby would write Blowing in the Wind, just four years later, and start fulfilling that prophecy. I have always believed that a spiritual connection of some kind was forged that night between Buddy Holly and Bobby Zimmerman. Though no one in the crowd was aware of it, I only know what I saw, and it looked a lot like a torch being passed. Right. So that was a, a very historic uh, evening. How and much older was Buddy Holly than so, Bobby? So Bobby was, was 17, Buddy Holly was 22. Wow. Just five years older. Mm. Oh, I just got chills. So he died when he was 20 22. Two. Yeah, he wow. dies three days later in the plane crash in Iowa. Mm. So, uh, mm. but this book is full of, of adventures and stories like this that cover a 50 year span. What was your earliest memory? Well, it was at Herzl Camp when we met. You know, when we, uh, when I was 11, he was 12. So, uh, of, of us together, that that was the beginning. And then I go forward uh, for 50 years, you know, covering all different facets of both of our lives. So pick me a um, one that you love. <laughs> okay, so here, here, here's an interesting one. It, uh, it goes like this. The title to the chapter is, Will the Real Idiot Please Stand Up? Right. <laughs> Not talking about you. Please. There you go. Okay, <laughs> all right. Coming off Tour 74, Bobby's creative juices were flowing big time. When I came back from Alaska in July, I went to see Bobby at his place outside of Minneapolis, and he played me the songs he had written. These songs would constitute his critically acclaimed album, Blood on the Tracks. Right. And I was one of the first people to hear them. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young are playing tonight in St. Paul, he said. Do you want to go with me? I was thinking... Does the bear shit in the woods? <laughs> of course I want to go. <laughs> he, we went to the concert, which was at the St. Paul Civic Center. Afterwards, we went to the hotel where the, ho where the band was staying. Bill Graham and Barry M. Hoff were the tour promoters, so we had a chance to see and visit with them again. After a while, Bobby mentioned to Stephen Stills that he had just written some new songs. And of course, Stephen wanted to hear them. So Bobby, Stephen, and I went into the bedroom of the suite, and Bobby played a few things. Stephen was obviously loaded, <laughs> and when Bobby sang Idiot Win, he became paranoid <laughs> and very agitated. <laughs> you wrote that song about me, he shouted. Why did you write that song about me? <laughs> he jumped up and got right in Bobby's face. As Bobby's friend and self-appointed protector, I jumped in between them so Stephen couldn't get any closer. Carefully, I eased Stephen back. <laughs> Bobby just laughed and said, Relax, man. The song's not about you, as he continued to sing and strum without missing a beat. Right. Millions of people around the world identify personally with Bobby's songs and feel as if he is speaking directly to them. But few of them are loaded enough <laughs> to think the songs are actually written about them. <laughs> it was oh, an interesting great. evening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like yeah. it, yeah. You guys met when, what time, what day, what date? So what was it, about 20 years ago? I guess it was. Yeah, about 20 years well, ago. Well, we were in the same room, but I didn't meet you. At, that night at Folk City, Oh, yes. When uh, uh, everybody was playing well, Patty well, Smith. Yeah, well, when it was Mike Porco's 61st right. birthday. Uh, it's just before we went north, we took the whole Rolling Thunder group over to the, the, uh, Curtis Folk City, and Bob performed, Joan performed, a lot of people 
perform. And Smokey was there, but we didn't meet that time. No, we didn't meet right. And you and I met with Sharon Kemp, your beloved sister, who I adore, yes. um, in 1975. Uh, well, I had met you earlier, but you introduced me, the two of you, to Bob the night before the plane went to Houston to get Hurricane Carter out of yes, jail. Yes, it, it was the uh, benefit concert in Houston for Hurricane Carter. And it must have been, it felt like there were like 80 people on the plane, well, and every one plane. of them was just extraordinary genius. Yeah, very Ringo Starr, we had a lot of people on that plane. It was, it was a very good uh, concert also, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it was thrilling. And I got to dance on stage right, I think, in a purple dress, I remember. <laughs> I'm sure you were stunning, so. <laughs> I was sitting? I'm sure you were stunning. Stunning, yes, yeah. I tried, I tried. Um, so pick me another moment of these pink um, papers. <laughs> okay. that well, this, one, this one's cute. Uh, people might get a kick out of this. I mean, this, the book is full of interesting and never, many never told before stories. All positive, only good stuff. No kiss and tell, only fun, positive mm -hmm. stories. <clears throat> so this one goes like this. <clears throat> it was Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, at the tail end of the 1980s. Bobby was attending services at the Chabad House in Santa Monica. Presiding was the venerable Rabbi Avram Levitansky, beloved and revered by his congregation. We had been there before and the rabbi recognized Bobby right away. But few of any of his fellow worshipers, all somberly dressed, realized he was standing at the back of the room. Having, as usual, missed the memo regarding the dress code, <laughs> Bobby was wearing cowboy boots, torn jeans, a hoodie, a black leather jacket, and what looked like a long lost pair of Jackie Kennedy sunglasses. <laughs> the big ones, you know? Right. Specifically, he was attending the Nila service. In Hebrew, Nila means the closing of the gate. As the day of Yom Kippur comes to a close and our future is being sealed, we turn to God to offer our repentance and new resolutions and ask that he seal us in the book of life. We ask him to grant us a new year replete with goodness and happiness. The Nila ends with the blowing of the shofar in the prayer that includes, next year may we be in Jerusalem. The ark housing the holy scrolls of the Torah remains open for the entire service and is considered a great honor to be chosen by the rabbi to open it. Right. This carries with it many blessings for the new year. The honor customarily goes to the temple's most generous donor. But not this time. With his ancient eyes, Rabbi Levitansky scoured the congregation. <laughs> At last, his gaze came to rest upon a solitary figure standing in the back of the room. He motioned the casually dressed fellow up to the pulpit, and up he came. Bob Dylan opened the ark on Yom Kippur. Oh, that's great. Afterwards, when the last echo of the shofar had diminished to silence and most of the congregants had trickled away, the biggest donor to the temple sought out Rabbi Levitansky and pulled him aside. I want you to know, Rabbi, said the man, that when you didn't call me up to open the ark, I was quite hurt. Then I saw whom you chose. And I realized that you were even wiser and kinder than I had imagined. So I'm going to double my contribution for the coming year. Wow. It takes a great and generous heart to give the honor of opening the ark for Neela to a homeless Jew. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbi has long since passed away, taking his spiritual secrets with him. Uh. As for the donor, Unless he reads it here, he still doesn't know that the homeless Jew was Bob Dylan. Right on. What a great story. A great oh, one, my God. Yeah. Let's have a song from yes. you, one of Bob's, Smokey, or you want to pick it. Oh, well, I, I, I imagine Smokey knows everything, right? No, I don't know. I'll pick one that, that you know let's that, see, that you're comfortable you singing. Should we do... Uh, what can you... Let's see. Feel comfortable. I, and I have a question with this one. 
Which one is this? It's, uh, it's called uh, Highway 61. All right. All right. Are you in this? Well, Highway 61 goes right through Duluth. It goes from the Canadian border through Duluth down to Texas. <clears throat> and it's the highway that when Bobby would come to Duluth, you know, he'd, then he'd hook up with it. And that's the highway that in those days took us down to Minneapolis and St. Paul when we go down there. Wow. So he traveled that highway up in the North Country together. The question is, are you Louis the King? Well, I don't know. I never, <laughs> never asked Bobby who his characters were. God said to Abraham, kill me a son. Abe said, man, you must be putting me on. God said, no. Abe said, what? God said, you can do what you want, Abe, but the next time you see me coming, man, you better run. Abe said, we well, want this killing done. God said, on highway 61. Georgia Sam had a bloody nose And for Howard, where can I go? Howard said there's only one place I know Sam said, tell me where I go Sam said, tell me quick, man, I got to run Howard just pointed with his gun He said, that way on Highway 61 The finger said to Louis the King, I got a forty written white and blue ship strings and a thousand telephones that do not ring. Do you know where I can get rid of these things? Louis said, I think it can be easily done. <laughs> but just take everything down to Highway 61. in there that's familiar to me. Of course, Highway 61 obviously goes back to his childhood days when he is in northern uh, Minnesota and traveling that road, uh, which we both did. And then uh, Abraham, you know, my blue-eyed son, his father's name is Abraham, and, right. and Bobby's got beautiful blue eyes, so there's a lot of you know, you can see where he pulls some stuff from. But are you Louis the Who King? knows? Oh, you're the only Louis knew. Well, who knows? I, you know, Bobby pulls images from all different parts of his life and his, his awareness and puts them together into these amazing songs. Yeah. So in the book, um, there's many people that people know of, and I'll just name drop. You, you mentioned Marlon. We talked about yeah. Joni Mitchell, yes. Harry Dean Stanton, Cher, Stephen Stills, Joan Baez, yes. Robbie Robertson, Sam Shepard, Tom Waits. Yes, all those people are, are... Ronnie Blakely, you mentioned Ronnie him? Ronnie Blakely is in there, too, yes. All these people, Roger McGuinn, are all, you know, mentioned in different uh, aspects in the book, yes. They all participated in different uh, uh, of these adventures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, 
I don't think we have enough time for an excerpt right now, but okay. you can free flow. But I'm going to read it and ask you to come back and Smokey to come back and we'll okay. do more chapters. Yeah, we can do that. And by then I'll be an expert on the yeah, book. Yeah, once you read it, you're going to know everything. Yeah. So tell us more, just whatever comes to your mind. Okay, well, we went to the, <coughs> I went to the last waltz with, with Bobby, mm -hmm. with, you know, which is an amazing show. Martin Scorsese. Martin Scorsese made that concert famous with, with his uh, documentary movie about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, people will see uh, that chapter. It's entitled The Last Waltz. And I suggest if they're not familiar with it, they should go on Netflix and watch it. It's an incredible mm -hmm. uh, documentary. And also Martin Scorsese just made The Rolling Thunder Review. Yes, he worked on that for seven years. He took the footage that was shot on the Rolling Thunder tour and he put that together into a documentary. And, and, the and you're in it. I'm in it. And the performance footage is amazing. Yes. Yeah, just amazing. And yes. I suggest people watch that if they haven't. And they, even if they have, they should watch it again because it's really good. Right. <laughs> so, so you uh, were saying you're at the last Yeah, I was waltz. at the last waltz. I'm just going to read. Uh, okay. okay. So Bobby and I were supposed to meet down the lobby. We had checked in the hotel. We went up to San Francisco together. At the point in time, I went down to meet Bobby, but he wasn't there yet. So I looked around for a place to wait. I spotted an empty chair next to a distinguished-looking black man. We greeted each other, and after a while, Bobby came down. He saw me and started in my direction. And when he was about 10 feet away, he started laughing. <laughs> I went over to meet him as we walked towards the door. Bobby was still chuckling. That, he said is one of the funniest sights I've ever seen. What? I asked innocently. Right. Muddy Waters and Louis Kemp sitting together. Oh. <laughs> that was Muddy Waters? Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that shows you Bob's sense, a, a little insight into Bob's sense of humor. Right. And to my naiveness, I didn't know, I didn't recognize Muddy, Muddy Waters. Muddy. So uh, when we were at the show, Bobby, about minutes before the, the concert was supposed to start, told Bill Graham, who was producing it, that he only would allow him to shoot two of the four songs that he was scheduled to sing. Mm -hmm. and, and Bill went bonkers. Bill said, you can't do that. The only way that we were able to get financing from Warner Brothers is if, if you were going to be in, you know, singing four songs and, and, and be the highlight of the show. He, but Bobby wouldn't relent, and he had his reasons, and it's explained in the book. And uh, he said, I'm putting Louie on stage, <laughs> Louie from Duluth, next <laughs> next to you and Marty, and he'll tell you when you can shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the first I heard about it. You know, he didn't tell me ahead of time. So, of course, I went on stage, stood next to them. I told the cameramen to come down from their towers. I told them to turn the cameras in the opposite direction. And I said, I'll tell you when you can go back up. Right on. Oh, yeah. They were going crazy. Everybody's going crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Bobby sings the first two songs. I, and uh, and then after the, as the second song was coming to an end, I said, okay, you guys can go back up. And they went back up and they started filming. And I can't remember what the third one was, but then the fourth one was Forever Young. Mm. Oh. Yeah, and he was supposed to stop there. That right. was it. He told me he was only singing four songs. That was what the uh, schedule was. He keeps going, <laughs> and and to everybody's surprise, and the band and everybody was caught off guard. He went back and started singing the first song again. <laughs> then he sang another song, <laughs> there, and then he ends up singing another song. Wow! And, yeah, and and I was trying to get uh, them to after he went on the fifth song and the sixth song. I was trying to get the camera and to stop filming and I was screaming shut down the cameras shut down the cameras and, and Marty pretended he didn't hear me he ignored me right and Bill started screaming at me right and Bill and I got into a screaming match and he grabbed me and I grabbed him and we're shaking each other and and he he started shouting you know and in you know a few things and uh, to make a long story short he said this is my show Nobody tells me what to do on my show, and, and it was wild. Anyway, they never stopped filming, and, and, and those songs were in the movie, and, and they were fabulous in the movie, but it was uh, quite a spectacle. What about wow. the other songs that uh, they weren't supposed to shoot, but they did? Yeah, so those... Does they ever appear? You know, I can't remember which ones were included, but I know some of it was. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah. 
So now, Smokey, would you sing us out with Blowing in the Wind? We only have a minute and 13 seconds. All right, Smokey, that's a good one. Oh, okay. You can do that one. Yeah, I can do it. I, uh, Excerpt. Do oh, it. okay. Do as much as you can. No, I can, I can do it. A minute, a minute and two it. seconds. Okay. <laughs> Two seconds. Uh, here's a short version of Blowing in the Wind by Smokey Rock. <laughs> uh, Friend.